Do you remember what you were like when you were 17 years of age? I would have put me as a junior in high school at 17. I was, I knew pretty much everything. I couldn't believe how little my parents knew. And I was amazed over time as I finally started to grow up and mature. I was amazed at how much my parents learned from the time I was 17 till I was in my mid twenties. Obviously, um, 17 year olds don't know everything, but there's a story in the Bible about a 17 year old. And uh, I would like to visit that for a few minutes today. It's a long story it begins in Genesis chapter 37. And it's the, the picture of the family of Jacob. Now Jacob and Esau have been reconciled and he settled down, has his own family. He has, um, has married several times, Leah. Uh, he was tricked into marrying. Rachel was the one he wanted. And there were others that were included because Rachel couldn't produce uh, the heir, male heirs that uh, Jacob wanted. But now in chapter 37, we find that uh, Rachel now is gone. She died in the childbirth of the youngest, Benjamin. And Jacob is, is living uh, on his property. He's well-established, very prosperous. Um, and the brothers, most of them are out working the land, taking care of the livestock. And the youngest uh, of that group, uh, Benjamin's still younger than Joseph, but Joseph has found a, a place um, in the family and um, is more of a, a homeboy than um, his older brothers who love to be outdoors, love to work in the fields. And Joseph, because he's stuck around close to Jacob, he's learned a lot of skills. Um, he's learned how to run a farm. He's learned administrative skills. He's learned leadership abilities. Uh, all those will come in handy in the years to come, but uh, for the most part, he doesn't know how to handle all that. In fact, he uses his favored position in, in a way that just irritates the life out of his brothers. Um, as we're looking at this passage, let me just read the opening verses of this 37th chapter. Jacob settled in the land where his father lived as an alien in the land of Canaan. And this is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Well, uh, they may not use this term in those days, but we know it. He was a tattletale. Um, he loved making his brothers uh, look bad, uh, thinking that that might make him look good. That never seems to work out too well. Um, but Joseph had been put in a position where um, he had some oversight. And so when he went out to the field to check on his brothers, he came back and told uh, Jacob that uh, they were not performing at the level that they should. Um, now the brothers resented it, um, and um, he was nothing but a, a pain to them. Um, another thing that happened that just made it worse was that uh, Jacob gave him this coat. We've also always referred to it as a coat of many colors. It was a distinctive garment. It wasn't something you wear while you're working out in the field. Um, it was used in administrative settings and when you're running the family business and you're dealing with others. Uh, transacting uh, the affairs of the family, um, you'd wear something like this. So Joseph liked to wear that thing around. And of course, his brother saw it as a symbol of all the things they didn't like about their younger brother. Um, well, as the story develops, and I wish we had time to go through everything in it, but let me just try to push through a little bit. Joseph um, is on his way to see his brothers again, and they see him coming. Now, the brothers have gotten to the point where they don't just despise it, Joseph. They hate him. And there's talk among them that they want to kill him. And they think they can get away with it because they take that despised coat of his, tear it into shreds, cover it with blood, and take it back to the father and say, you know, we don't know what happened. We think a wild animal must have gotten him. So they're ready to kill their own brother. They threw him down in a cistern as they were debating. Well, the older brother... Um, finally becomes the voice of reason. He says, we can't kill him. We, we, we can't do that. Um, and about that time in the vicinity, there's a caravan of slave traders. So they come up with a plan and the plan simply is to pull Joseph out of the well and sell him to the slavers uh, and then go back and tell their dad what had happened. So at least they wouldn't have his blood on their hands, even though 
for all intents and purposes, they could just forget about him. Being a slave in those days, you could end up in a couple of um, circumstances that would almost guarantee your death. Uh, you could be sold to a galley, ships in the, that plied the waters of the Mediterranean, or you could be uh, sold to a salt mine. Neither of those had uh, a long life expectancy. Fortunately for Joseph, he ends up in Egypt, and better than that, he ends up sold as a slave to um, Potiphar, who is the captain of the guard, the royal guard, the palace guard uh, for Pharaoh. And there is where some of those skills he learned in his father's tents come in handy because he begins to do things in the household that proves that he has the ability to, to, um, to monitor and to run things, to get things done. Potiphar recognizes that and ultimately makes him a trustee of the entire household. So in effect, Joseph calls the shots when Potiphar's not around. Well, not, not only did Potiphar notice him, so did his, his wife. And his wife saw a good looking young man. Uh, Potiphar's gone on state business. She's lonely. Um, she begins to think that this young man is hers for the taking. And so she makes uh, her uh, wishes known. And Joseph continues to resist and resists until one time uh, she's got him trapped and he can't get away unless he just take runs for it. She grabs him by the, by the outer garment on the robe he was wearing and he escapes. Um, she is furious and you know what they say about a woman scorned. Um, she wanted revenge. And so she cries out and challenges and accuses Joseph of assaulting her. Well, Potiphar comes home and hears this stuff and he believes his wife, no matter what Joseph said, um, to Joseph's credit, um, his desire to stay away from this temptation was twofold. One was to honor Potiphar. He wasn't going to do anything to betray the trust that Potiphar had in him. And secondly, he learned something else in his family um, tents and his family life. And that was he had a responsibility to God to live the right way. Well, Potiphar ultimately does what he has to do, and that is he throws Joseph into prison. It was a prison that was specifically um, catered to uh, prisoners, political prisoners and others that Pharaoh was displeased with. And Joseph finds um, a circumstance where he gets to know two of the court officials who've been thrown there because they displeased Pharaoh. But along uh, his time, his sentence there, he also proves again that he's got these skills, these administrative and leadership skills, and he becomes the chief trustee of the prison. He hears the stories of these two men, how how sad it, it was that they were treated this way, and he wants to help. Uh, he listens to them, and they say, well, we've, got, we've had these dreams. We don't know what they mean. And so he listens to them, and because he's a good listener, um, he tries to put the pieces together. He, he gives one good news, the other one bad news. One's going to be restored, the other one's going to be executed. The one who's to be restored, Joseph says, now when you go back to Pharaoh's court, would you just remember me? I've been here for two years. I've been forgotten. And um, the man promises, oh yeah, I'll tell Pharaoh what a help you were to me. And um, then promptly forgets Joseph. But over time, Pharaoh has a troubling dream, and he's talking there among his court officials, and one of the guys there, the one who'd been restored, says, I know this guy. He's in your own prison. And so Joseph prepares himself to go see Pharaoh, and Pharaoh basically leans on Joseph, and Joseph once again proves his abilities. Uh, and in, in, in part, because he has this spiritual insight, he's able to ha help Pharaoh uh, determine a course that they must take in order to preserve life. Um, there's a famine. And so Joseph is elevated to the second highest position. He's not Pharaoh, but he is the prime minister and makes provisions for foods to be, food to be set aside. And not only for Egypt, but also for the surrounding regions. And a, a part of that is uh, the land where Jacob has settled. And they too are experiencing the difficulties of the famine. Instead of depending on God to provide and protect, Jacob sends the brothers down to Egypt to see if they can work a deal and get some food and help the family to, to um, survive. So at this point, uh, Joseph is overseeing this massive project uh, and these, these guys from Canaan show up. 
Joseph immediately recognizes them, but they don't recognize Joseph. First of all, they weren't expecting to see him. Secondly, he wasn't a 17 year old anymore. And thirdly, he's dressed like an Egyptian official. So they wouldn't have recognized him in any case. Joseph's reaction was one of, of grief, not of sadness, but of a sense of loss and that he had been disconnected all these years. And now perhaps here was an opportunity. They work out a deal. And as you probably know, um, Jacob ends up coming down to Egypt. All the family moves to, down there because Joseph had threatened to hang on to Benjamin if they didn't. And so uh, Joseph had just used that as a means to get the family within reach. Uh, interestingly enough, because he's the prime minister and has this, this great power, um, he could have had those guys executed. Nobody had thought another thing. But that's not what he was about. He was about reconciliation. He was about restoring uh, himself to that family and to his father. He says something to the brothers that I think is particularly appropriate for where we are as a, as a church. Uh, I've only been here for a few weeks, and I, I just realized how many of our families have gone through uh, such tough circumstances. We've had people who've lost their loved ones, parents who had to bury their children, um, we've had all kinds of impact from the pandemic, the economic struggles. It's hard. It's just really hard. But when Joseph sees his brothers and the brothers are very much afraid of what could happen to them, Joseph says to them, what you meant for, for harm, God meant for good. And throughout this whole um, journey of Joseph's, one thing is so very obvious Again and again, it's mentioned that, that God was with Joseph. God was with Joseph when he was in the hands of the slavers. God was with Joseph when he was in that prison. God was with Joseph as he was put in this position of authority. Um, and so I think it's important for you and I to, re to realize that we are not alone. Uh, we have not been abandoned. And even when difficult times come, when we find ourselves faced with circumstances that we don't know how we're going to get out of, it's so, so important for us to remember that we have a God who sees all that there is to see, knows all there is to know, loves us with a love that will not let us go. And because of that, we can trust him. So whatever happens to us that might seem harmful, God can turn that into something good. Romans eight twenty eight. we all know it. God works in amazing ways. And he does things that we'll never truly understand this side of heaven. But the one thing we can count on is God will be through with us no matter what. God bless you in these days.